I plan to go through FPP, but I don't plan on going through the UI and everything else. Um, I just, I guess I feel that going through screen after screen, if, you, if you've got no idea what a Pi is, that's just confusing. And if you already know what a Pi is, that's just boring. So I'm choosing a ground to instead uh, focus on the features, what it does, why it does it, and so forth. So for those that haven't seen a Raspberry Pi, and so it really is that small. And it's a fully functional computer. It's got, uh, it's got video, it's got sound, um, it's got USB, it takes a keyboard and a mouse. Um, and they're designed so the kids can actually plug them in and use them as a, as a computer. They run, um, they run a flavor of uh, Linux. Um, they have a GUI, they have a visual programming language, right, a whole bunch of stuff. But we use them to uh, drive pixels or drive screens um, and projectors and the like. Um, so they have an Ethernet port. All of them from the Model B uh, up have an Ethernet port. Um, I think it's version 2 has the Wi-Fi. Version, version. Three. version 2 version two does it? Yeah. Okay, well, version three. 3 has a Wi-Fi port. And, um, and that's really powerful because it lets you do things like bridge networks. Um, so you can run all of your, your pixels out of the, the Ethernet port on the controller and connect it back into your home network and you can still access your controllers even without plugging into it, which is, which is kind of convenient. Um, I have a presentation on that if people want to see it. Um, HDMI, so you can attach a screen, so you can attach a projector, you can run video, display it on a wall or your garage door or whatever else it is, and you can synchronize that all up. It has audio. The audio is not brilliant. Some people have good experiences. Personally, it works fine for me, but a number of people have complained about the quality of audio that comes out of these. And so some people like to uh, run a USB audio card for their audio for their show. Um, and most importantly, and it's hidden away inside this box, there are a bunch of general purpose input and output pins. And they're the pins that you plug the Pi caps into the like to drive your pixels. Um, and they're very low power. They run on 5 volts. Uh, they're pretty good. Falcon Pi Player, on the other hand, is the software that runs on top of it. Um, so the Pi Player, the original Pi Player software was developed by David Pitts. It's now maintained primarily by Captain Murdoch. Um, it's open source. You can go and download it, build it, change it. Um, it can function in a number of different modes, and this is actually where a lot of the confusion around the Pi starts to come in. If it just did one thing, it would be reasonably easy to set up. But because it does so many different things, the UI does, after a while, get slightly confusing. And so you need to be conscious of what you're planning to use it for. I run Falcon Pi Player for three different purposes. One, to run a set of P10 panels. One, as a pixel controller, to run a whole stack of pixels. And one, as a show player. All right, and it can fill all of those roles. Show player, a pixel controller, a panel controller running P10s, or as a video player driving a projector and, and projecting a movie or something up. It runs on the Pi. It also runs on the BeagleBone Black. Some people run on the green. And there's potential for it to run on a bunch of other small size computers as well. And a number of people have been trying to get it to work on various flavors. Every time someone comes out with a new single board computer, Someone posts a thread about, oh, can we get Falcon Pi Player to run on this? Um, the, the primary challenges are things like the inputs and outputs. So why? Why would you use it as show player? Primarily, it's because it doesn't tie up your computer. Right? If you've just got one laptop, the one that you sequence on, and you don't want to set it aside for your Christmas lights for a whole month in December, it's kind of nice to be able to run your show on one of these and not tie your computer up for the whole month. It has a, a, a web server in it, and you configure it through the web interface, but you can also control it through the web interface. And there's a couple of plugins that are available that give you, you know, very simple UI for stopping songs, jumping to the next song, things like that. And that's kind of nice to be out in the yard and say, oh, that's my favorite song. Someone showed up, I want to show my best song, and you just press a button and off it goes. It's kind of nice. It also has the ability to run and, and Daryl touched on it in a sort of master remote type fashion. Right, so normally what happens with your show, and this gets a bit of a problem when you're running large P10 uh, panels and the like, is your show player is trying to pump all of the data over the network to those, those matrices. 
And that can get really large. You can get into several hundred universes pretty quickly if you're running a lot of panels. Um, and while these are powerful boards, one of the limiting factors on them is actually the speed of the network interface. It's actually quite possible to swamp it. I swamped mine and couldn't get any more out of it. And so what the Pi player has is this ability to uh, set up a relationship with several Pies where one acts as a master and one acts as a remote. And every 16 frames, it sends a packet to the other one to say, this is where I'm up to. And the other one just plays the show locally and listens for these packets and makes sure that it stays in sync. And so all the data that would across the network is replaced by one packet just under once a second. Okay? Um, that's really low volume, so it works really well. And so when Daryl talked about um, the Falcon boards and those ESP pixel sticks offer, uh, starting to operate where you put the FSCQ files onto the controllers themselves, it's the same concept. Now you have a master that instead of blasting all that data out, is just saying to everyone, approximately once a second, this is where you should be up to. Keep playing if this is where you're up to it. If you're a little bit ahead, slow down. If you're a little bit slow, speed up. Okay, so it's nice and reliable. Definitely reduces your network traffic. As a show player, um, it plays, so basically it requires the FSCQ data. So you go and develop your sequence in Vixen or, or XLite, and you save it away as an FSCQ file, which is a really large file that represents all of the pixel data that will be played throughout a song. You then take that FSCQ file and you upload it onto um, the Pi player or onto an SD card that you plug into it, and that's the data that it's going to play while it's playing. Um, it will also upload uh, the MP3 file or the video file that it's going to play as well and get stored on the, um, uh, actually get stored on the USB stick um, on the player. It has a scheduler. It's a pretty basic scheduler. Um, it needs a few enhancements. It doesn't do midnight very well. Um, but look, basically, it's, it's a functional scheduler which will, will play your show. Um, it does have an event model. It has, you know, it can use those same pins that we talked about earlier to receive physical events like button presses and the like. Um, it can also re react to network um, input as well, and you can tell it to do certain things when those events occur. Um, uh, it can also drive via the USB ports, um, uh, you know, a Renard dongle or an LOR dongle, and you can connect things up to it that way. Um, and it also has some modes in which you can do things like overlay uh, real-time text data onto matrices, like, you know, the number of sleeps till Christmas or, you know, putting up uh, names that people text in. They're advanced type topics, you know, you're going to have to get on the forums, ask a lot of questions, find people that have done that stuff before. It's non-trivial to set up but it can really you know, add another dimension to your show if you want to go that way. Sorry? Yeah, see Brad. I know you do. Yeah. But yeah, you can do it. As a pixel controller, um, so it can also act as a pixel controller one of uh, a couple of ways. Uh, one is the, the Pi Cap or um, uh, the, the Pixel Pi type um, attachment onto uh, the, the headers. Um, you can also, on a BeagleBone Black, put a cape. So I use the RGB123 cape. It gives me 48 pixel outputs on a BeagleBone Black. Um, and each one of those will run 600 odd pixels. So it becomes a very powerful control. Yeah, you've got some capes here as well, yeah. So you need a BeagleBone Black, you plug it in, and it drives a whole bunch of outputs. Um, these things don't come with a real-time clock, which is a real pain. It means you either need to get them onto a network that's connected to the internet, so they can go out to a time source and get the, in, uh, the time, or you configure it manually and you don't turn the damn thing off, right? Or you get yourself something with a real-time clock on it so you can set it and keep it, although I find they're really unreliable. Yeah, I've got one. That, I've, I've got one that doesn't work. I got a real-time clock like that. It was yeah. five bucks, and it just doesn't work. It doesn't hold it. You can't do power distribution through them, though, right? So some of the Pi caps may let you do it, but I know my capes don't. I've got to do all my power distribution separate from the board, which, as Daryl said earlier, I'd prefer as well. I don't like running power through my controllers generally. Um, 
And as a pixel controller, you can run it in a master mode, so it can act like a local sort of just drive some local pixels, or you put it in bridge mode where it acts like just like any other controller, it receives pixel data in the Ethernet port and it drives the outputs, which is probably the more common way to run it as a pixel controller. As a panel controller, um, as a panel controller, you can either, again, on the, the GPIO headers, you can add uh, one of the, the panel controllers that will drive typically about 12 panels um, locally off the Pi. Um, or on the BeagleBone Black, you can put an Octoscroller type um, cape on it and you can get about 64 panels out of one of those, of the P10s. Um, I don't think it'll run the others, right? It's only the P10s. Uh, scan. No, scan. Yeah. Will do the P6s though? Oh, will it? Certain right. Um, again, you can run it as a master. Or, um, or remote and in bridge mode, so you can pump the data into it. But most people, when they run panels, would probably run it as a remote uh, rather than uh, pumping lots and lots of data at it. As a video player, uh, you'd plug the Pi into the, uh, with your projector into the HDMI port. Um, you would load your video file onto it, and the video would be associated with your sequence. And when your sequence kicks off, it would play the video out the, uh, the, the HDMI port. Again, in master remote mode. How-to guide. There are quite extensive instructions on the, the Falcon site explaining how to set them up. Read the instructions, read the instructions really carefully and follow them um, because they, they are quite specific. And if you, if you get it wrong, you will invariably have to go back and restart it. Um, but there's a whole bunch of stuff there that goes through how to set it. Um, set it up and I, and I didn't plan to go through and do that and bore you all with the UI. Over the last uh, six months or so we've also been working um, in XLights to try and make XLights better at configuring this thing for you. It's been a real challenge because of the many different ways in which it can be used so it's kind of hard to configure it and in a way that just doesn't generate a lot of complexity back into XLights. Um, so a couple of things that you can do. Um, if you're running this as a master, uh, you can upload all the universes that you want it to issue. If you're running this as a bridge, you can upload all the universes you want it to listen to. Just right click, sorry, just go up to the tools menu and select um, FPP Connect and you can upload all of that. So with mine, I have 110 universes, right, it's a couple of clicks. This is configured to listen to those 110 universes. Saves a lot of time. Um, it can also upload your sequences and associated audio files. So I can go down the list, select all my FSCQs, say they're the ones I want to send, and it will just upload them all onto uh, your Falcon, uh, sorry, onto your, your Pi player. If you've got several, if you've got slaves and whatever, as long as they're all plugged in and you've defined them, you can do a one-click upload and it will actually go and upload it to all of them one at a time, a single click. Uh, the Pi Player is able, you are able to upload your, your media and your FSCQ files to just your master and it will actually send it out to, uh, to the remotes, but it's very slow. You wouldn't want to be doing that five minutes before your show starts. <laughs> um, so yeah, being able to blast it all up um, is kind of convenient. So why not FPP? There, there are a couple of challenges that I, people do run into with them. Um, if you already have a show computer that you, know, you do use, if, you, uh, if you've had a show computer for a while and you, know, you don't want the complexities of running yet another device, maybe not. Um, it can be fiddly to set up. It's another thing you've got to learn. Um, if it works, it's great. When it doesn't work, it's kind of frustrating <laughs> to deal with. Um, Stability issues, um, they do like to uh, stay turned on. Um, people have had problems with them corrupting when they turn them off, particularly if you've got them on a timer and you just drop the power to them. You know, I've, personally, I've never experienced it, but I've read enough people who are saying, I oh, corrupted, I had to go and um, reload the operating system. You know, most people will keep a couple of backup copies of the little SD card a couple of backup copies of this just in case because you don't want your show to be down in the middle of bad sectors. I actually run mine on a UPS just in case. Yeah. 
you know, oh. if you want to do that. But again, more complexity, right? Yes. It's more complexity, and that's, you know, I, personally, I just leave mine on all the time. Yeah. It's easier. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's interesting. If you get on the forums, there's a lot of discussion about it. There, there are some ways that you can configure it to minimise the amount of writing that it does, like turn off all the logging and all that sort of stuff. And some people claim that that makes them a lot more stable. Personally, I leave it on all the time. It uses bugger all power. Just put it on a separate circuit. Don't put it on a timer. Just leave this running all the time. When your controllers come up, it's fine. The other problem that they have is if you set these up to send data out to your controllers using unicast, and that controller is not present on the network, this slows down badly. Right? And the more controllers that you've got that aren't online, the slower it gets. Five seconds later, it can get really bad. Which is, you know, so you're out there and you just want to test one controller, you turn it on and this damn thing, you know, it's only updating every five seconds or something and people are going, I don't understand what's wrong with my show, it's not working. And if they turned all their controls on, it would be fine. Um, so, and that's got to do with Linux on the machine. It's got nothing to do with the Pi Player software itself. It's got to do with the operating system. But there's some reasons not to use it. Version 2. Long delayed been promised now for a couple of years. Um, there are some interesting features on some of the, the unreleased branches. Um, a number of features have been pulled forward into version 1.9 and, and started to appear. Um, the big thing about version 2 is meant to be a user interface rewrite. Um, they're also meant to be making it much more uh, API enabled so that people can write other integrations into it and control it a lot better. Um, the sparse FSCQ file is also rumoured to be coming. This enables us to, at the moment, when you, let's say you're running a master and three slaves and each slave's running separate elements, today you have to copy the FSCQ file in its entirety to all of those boxes. The sparse FSCQ in theory allows you to generate smaller FSCQ files for each remote with only the channels of data that they need. Right, which would significantly reduce the amount of data that you've got to upload onto all the controllers. Um, a big deal, particularly if you're running some ESP pixel sticks and you've got to upload that FSCQ file over wireless to a, an underpowered device. Um, uh, there's been a lot of work done on some direct support for uh, some of the panel protocols like uh, Colorlight and the like, so that's been going on. But there's still no release date. Um, I don't think it's going to make the expo this year. Maybe they'll get something out later in the year. It's hard to know. And that's it.